Um, so I'm, fin I'm Amanda Quirk, and I'm finishing up my first year of graduate school here at UCSC, and I've been working with Raja Guhathakurta to study asymmetric drift in M31. So asymmetric drift is the offset in the dynamics between the gas and the stars in a disk, and is VA in this gene's equation. It's very important because it gives us insight into a galaxy's heating history. It also tells us about the current state of dynamics, including velocity dispersion, stability criterion, and whether or not there are interactions going on with the bar. This is particularly interesting for M31 because it's had such a violent history of mergers. It's also at the perfect distance for this kind of study because it's far enough away that we can measure asymmetric drift across the entire disk of M31, but close enough that we can do it for individual stellar populations. And so my stellar populations come from the intersection of the FAT and SPLASH survey. FAT survey is outlined in white is, and is photometry from Hubble. And the SPLASH survey are the pink points here. And that's spectroscopy from Deimos. I've divided this stellar population into four groups based on average stellar age. The first, um, low high massive, short-lived main sequence stars with an average age of 30 mega year. Then intermediate mass AGB stars with an, an average age of 400 mega years. Older, also intermediate age AGB stars with an average age of two giga year. And low mass RGB stars with an average age of four giga year. And you can see there's a part of the color magnitude diagram that I um, avoid because the, this area is likely to be populated by Milky Way foreground stars. So I've measured the dynamics of these stars, as you can see here. In the first panel, it's the shortest lived main sequence stars, or the first column, then young AGB stars, older AGB stars, and the longest lived red giant branch stars. The first row shows individual line of sight velocity. That's what the color is in the plot. The middle row shows locally average line of sight velocity. You can see the size of the smoothing circles used for in each panel. And I average the velocities to better match the gas dynamics, which I'll talk about later, or the way the gas was observed. And the bottom panel sh show the local velocity dispersion. And as you can see that as you go from shorter lived to longer lived, velocity dispersion increases. This is something that was found by Claire Dorman in 2015. I've deprojected these line of sight velocities into rotation velocities using the tilted ring model shown here to create rotation curves. In each of these sets of rotation curves, the top panel is the shortest lived main sequence stars, then young AGB, older AGB, and the longest lived RGB stars. Because I am studying asymmetric drift, I want to compare these rotation velocities with velocities of gas, and I do that with two different types of gas. This first set of rotation curves also has H1, or neutral gas, from Laurent Schimann in 2009. And that's represented by the gray points in each rotation curve. And the second column is um, a comparison to molecular CO gas, which was collected by Newton et al. in 2006. And there are two main takeaways. Um, and I've coupled the gas and stars in such a way that at every stellar line of sight, there's a corresponding gas data point. So it's a direct comparison. And there are two main takeaways for this plot. One, the gap between the stellar rotation curve and the gas rotation curve, or the asymmetric drift, increases as you go from the shorter lived populations to the longer lived populations. And two, these rotation curves are rather messy. There's a lot of substructure and scatter that we see here. So for the remainder of my talk, I'll first go into more detail about the asymmetric drift, and then I'll talk more about some of the possible sources of scatter and substructure in the rotation curves. I've plotted the distributions of asymmetric drift for each of the stellar populations seen here. The left panel is asymmetric drift with respect to the neutral gas, and the right panel is with respect to the molecular gas. And I've defined asymmetric drift as the distance difference between the gas rotation speed and the stellar rotation speed. In each of these panels, the blue is the short-lived main sequence stars, the magenta is the younger AGB stars, the black, the older AGB stars, and the red, the longest lived RGB stars. And for both of these panels, you see that the peak of the distribution shift to the right or towards a greater magnitude of asymmetric drift as the longevity of these stellar populations increases. 
So like velocity dispersion, asymmetric drift is a function of stellar age. And I want to make sure that none of the substructure or scatter in the rotation curves is influencing this measure at all, this measurement. So I've um, examined possible sources of the substructure and scatter. And the first that I look at is multiplicity in the H1 spectrum. The H1 covers the entirety extent of um, the stellar population, so I focus on this gas. And because M31 has a very complex geometry, uh, it has multiple warps in it. When you look along one line of sight, you might be passing through multiple clouds of H1. This gives you different a number of peaks in the component. And when Shema took this data, he allowed a model, he had a model that allowed for up to five velocity peaks in the H1 spectrum. So this plot shows complexity of the line of sight as denoted by the number of peaks in the H1 spectrum. And you can see that the most complex line of sight, those that have five peaks in the H1 spectrum, are clustered around here, which might be coincident with the bar. So maybe the bar is disturbing some of the H1 gas. I've broken these, each of the age groups, the stellar age groups, down based on the complexity of the line of sight as denoted by the number of peaks in the H1. So in this top panel, you see velocity, dispersion, cumulative histograms. And in the bottom panel, asymmetric drift cumulative histograms. The shortest lived main sequence stars are in the first column, then the young AGB, the older AGB stars, and the longest lived RGB stars. And each line in the panel represents a different complexity of line of sight. And you can see there is a small trend with number of peaks in the H1 spectrum. As the line of sight becomes more complex, you do get a slightly greater magnitude of velocity dispersion or asymmetric drift. And you get this nice rainbow color. However, you still see that with all line of sight complexity, there is an increase in velocity to dispersion and asymmetric drift with stellar age. So despite this trend, we're still seeing that asymmetric drift is a function of stellar age. Similarly, you've, I've divided a rotation curve for the RGB population into um, line of sight complexity with the first panel here being the least complex line of sight, and then it continues to the most complex line of sight, and equals five. And you can see that there is a clear lack of simple or not complex line of sights in the inner region of M31, and the most complex line of sights definitely favor this region. So there is definitely a complex geometry going on in the inner region of M31. But despite this, you still see the, about the same amount of substructure and scatter at all complexity of line of sights. The second possible source of scatter or substructure in the rotation curves is the model that I use to deproject the line of sight velocity into rotation velocity. So again, that's the tilted ring model. This model is well behaved along the major axis, which is this region shown in the wedge here. And the deprojection factor approaches a minimum of one. However, as you move away from the major axis, this factor increases, and along the minor axis approaches infinity. So that could definitely cause some scatter in the rotation curves. And to check this, I've again divided the stellar populations, um, but this time based on where they lie in the disk. So this first set of rotation curves are those that are close to or along the major axis, and they have a resulting low deprojection factor. The other set, they lie far away from the major axis, so they have a much higher deprojection factor. And you can see that there is far less scatter in this first set of rotation curves. So where the model is well behaved, there is less scatter. This has much more scatter. But you can still see that there is substructure in these rotation curves, even where the model is well behaved. So the tilted ring model definitely does not describe Andromeda's complexity in, a way, um, in an adequate enough way to deal with um, the deprojection factor on the minor axis. And just for a sanity check, I've compared using this model to a simpler model, a planar disk model, where in the equation, every star is given the same ring position angle and inclination angle. And so you can see the results of this model on the right of the figure he's shown here. And you can see these rotation curves also don't look very great. And so a simpler model does not adequately explain M31's complex geometry as well. 
So we need to find a better model, but it does look like this substructure is definitely something in M31. So there are two main conclusions to take away from this talk. Asymmetric drift is a function of stellar age, like velocity dispersion. And the tilted ring model does not do an adequate job explaining the complexity of M31's disk geometry. This project has some um, logical next steps. First, to measure the shape of the velocity ellipsoid in M31. Emily did a really great job motivating why this is important, and I hope to be able to contribute to this work in M31. I've also started to, come to analyze simulated M31 analogs from the Illustra simulation to see if analogs that have recently had a major merger can reproduce the trend of increasing asymmetric drift with stellar age. And this coming fall, the velocity ellipsoid can also be described by this equation. And this coming fall, we will be taking spectroscopy with DEMOS on M33. So I'll be able to reproduce this analysis with um, another galaxy. This will be interesting, especially then to study the shape of the velocity ellipsoid because M33 is much less inclined. So we'll be better able to um, constrain the vertical component. So I'll go back to my conclusion slides and I'd be happy to take any questions. Questions? Uh, could you clarify what you mean by the complexity of the geometry? You mean there are little warps and things of that kind within the disk structure that's different for the gas and the stars. Is that correct or something yes. else? Yes, so the, the gas disk is especially complex. It has warps. It also has an outer warp that projects into the inner radii. So it looks like there's a warp within a warp or multiple warps in the inner regions of M31, but that's a projection effect. So these models also don't adequately account for that. We see this in the gas, and that's why you get the multiple peaks in the H1 spectrum. Oh, I see. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. More questions? Yep. Let's take again, Amanda. 